Welcome to the Polari Podcast with me, Sophia Blackwell. And me, Paul Burston. And we're going to be talking about the recent Polari show in Manchester. Paul, how was it leaving London and doing a show outside? Well, I love going to Manchester. It's one of my favourite places in the country. And we've been there a couple of times before over the years. We've, we've performed at um, Manchester Lit Fest. And we've also been to a GAY Manchester before. But there was a particular energy and um, buzz around this event. It was, it was incredible. It was, so, it was really busy. We had s- some younger people involved that I've not worked with before. And I think they brought a different audience in than we normally get. So previous events we've had in Manchester have tended to be the kind of average age would be, I don't know, 30 something. And there were a lot of younger LGBTQ people um, quite quite a fair bunch actually um, who were in their sort of student age and early 20s and it just gave a different energy to the night because there was a combination of sort of seasoned performers and then people who weren't performers necessarily but they their coming out stories had been featured in one of the books um, Emma Goswell's book and she was talking to them on stage and they were reading out part of their coming out story so it was it felt some it felt very um, community and very special and quite a few people in the audience waited at the end to speak to me and were very emotional about the, about the evening which, which which was really a lovely thing to to experience it felt meaningful to them more more than just being an entertainment you know it felt like a community sharing of of our stories and our our, our space for me that's always been part of what Polari is about but you do, you, do, you don't always know that the audience is registering that element you know sometimes it's sometimes they they're just out for a night out and that's fine but it was great to, to know that it it had actually struck so many chords there were there were there were there were two women in particular who just one of them just basically cried throughout the entire evening I mean, she just sat there weeping <laughs> the entire evening. I was a bit concerned about her, actually. <laughs> um, but she, she was just moved by it. It wasn't that she was sad. She was just very moved by hearing people share their, their stories. Welcome to Polari Manchester. My name is Paul Burston. I'm an author and journalist. And I've been running Polari since 2007. Uh, Polari is a live showcase for established and emerging LGBTQ plus literary talent authors, poets, spoken word performers. We're based in London's South Bank Centre. We also run the UK's only prize for LGBTQ writing, called the Polari Prize, now in its 11th year. You can find out more from our website, which is polarisalon.com. Um, we also tour regularly, funded by the Arts Council. And last February, we got a grant to go on tour all around the UK, 22 years. And then the world starts. So most of our events have taken place online, but tonight we're here in person together! I'm so glad we're in Manchester because I love, love, love being in Manchester, one of my favourite places in the country. We have a wonderful line for you tonight of local and visiting talent. And to kick us off, Emma Goswell hosts the weekend outing on Virgin Radio Pride, as well as presenting cover shows for BBC Radio Manchester. The Coming Out Stories podcast, she hopes, has now had over 100,000 listeners. And now there's Coming Out Stories, the book, which tells the stories of 27 people from across the LGBTQI plus spectrum. To tell us more, please welcome Emma. hosting the closing party tonight, so that finishes tomorrow, it's just a pop-up station in the summer. So I've done my last show for them, so I'm not on there. Um, and secondly, I feel a bit of a being here, because as I said to Paul, I said, I'm not really a writer. Um, and he said, yeah, but you're a journalist. Somehow, even though I'm dyslexic, I have got a book out. So I don't know. <laughs> How did that happen? No, I'm actually a broadcast journalist and a radio presenter, and funny enough, a straight friend of mine, suggested three and a half years ago that I did a podcast called Coming Out Stories and I thought that's a bit boring, shall we at the stage where it doesn't matter, people can come out, it's whatever they want these days, can't they? How wrong was I? So the last three and a half years I've been collecting stories from across the world, from this, um, then we got contacted by a publisher, we thought it was a scam, turns out it and they said we've always wanted to do a collection of coming out stories, there isn't a celebrity, there's a lot of celebrities out there with their coming out stories, aren't there, you know, you've got Gareth Thomas, 
um, like Tina film, well, a lot of the slabs have done it, but non real stories from real people who live real lives and find out what happened. And so basically, you've done all the hard work, so why don't we just use the stories that you've collected? Emma Goswell was was first up. I knew I know Emma obviously from her radio work because I've been a guest on her various shows over the years, and I knew about the coming out collection and the podcast that goes with it. Well, the podcast came first and then the collection, and we'd spoken about me coming to Manchester, and I said, "Well, why don't you come and do something with your book?" And I thought it would be good to get some of the people that are in the book, whose true life stories are, are, are recounted in this in the book, to come and share them with us. Um, so this is my story. Um, it was the beginning of 1989. I was busy pretending to care about my A-levels, wearing far too much eyeliner, listening to The Cure a lot, and I still haven't mastered the Rubik's Cube. In my yes. head, I was... <laughs> <laughs> Who actually honestly could do that? Um, in my head, I was a rebel, a goth, a poet. One thing I definitely wasn't was gay. The thought honestly hadn't crossed my mind. I fancied loads of boys, hadn't I? I even dated some of them. Uh, it being the late 80s, they'd have names like Gavin and Kevin, yeah. Warlock to Denim, and Love Bon Jovi. <laughs> <laughs> I think I nearly had sex with Kevin at a party in Bermondsey in 1988, but I couldn't actually drink enough gin's to go through that. <laughs> I'd spoken to a lot of people who knew exactly, or who knew from the, that they were gay from a very young age. But for me, it was a very specific moment. I can tell you that I first realised I was gay on the 26th of January 1989. Very specifically, sometime between 10pm and 11pm. <laughs> I was on a coach coming back from a rare school trip to London. We'd been to say Les Miserables in the uh -huh. West End. Sometimes I joke that Les Mis made me gay. Uh, but what actually happened was that on the coach, I met someone who changed my life. I started talking to a girl who was quite new to our school. She was in the year below me. And I don't know if about a month or two, but I'd really paid no attention whatsoever. But the more I started talking to her, for the first time I thought, wow, why are you so amazing? God, you're an incredible person. Wow, I really want to touch you. Oh my God! <laughs> What's that about? Why do I want so much of you? What is going on? My mind was in turmoil. Because that was the first time I'd actually ever questioned my sexuality. I am a slow developer, but quite a fast mover. So to cut a long story short, I convinced her to stay the night with me. This is pointing me in a, painting me in a very bad light. <laughs> yes, if nothing else, no one can accuse me of taking things slowly. I woke up the next morning and thought my life was over rather than my life beginning. I really was unbelievably messed up about it. I just thought there was a secret that I couldn't tell anyone. I felt elated in one sense because I felt like I was truly in love. But I also felt like it was a dirty secret and I couldn't tell anyone. My girlfriend felt the same as I did. Both of us were just terrified of being discovered. I stayed silent for months. Months of having the most incredible love affair of my life, but not feeling able to share it with anyone. But then, unfortunately, about nine months after it started, she ended it. And, not only that, she dumped me while Only You by Yazoo was playing, and that ruined that credit song. <laughs> Absolutely. After that, I was absolutely traumatised, and that ultimately led to my family going, what the hell is wrong with Emma? I was really morose, I was depressed. In the end, my dad took me to one side, he took me to his bedroom for a talk, and he said, Emma, what is wrong with you? And then, because I couldn't really speak, he um, couldn't find the words, he just gave me a multiple choice of answers. <laughs> so he did like the menu of parental nightmares. So the exact wording of what he said to me was, Emma, what is wrong with you? Are you on drugs? Are you pregnant? Or are you a lesbian? <laughs> <laughs> Making my dad sound more scary than he actually is. Um, and I was so scared, so I just went, yeah, one of them. <laughs> uh, now, to be honest, I'm not a parent, but I think I picked the best one. Um, he took straight away what I meant, what the actual answer was, and it was fine. Basically, we cried and we hugged, and then because we were we went to the pub and drank beer. Um, I think my mother knew anyway. I found out later she'd been through all of my love letters from my first girlfriend. Um, it's hard to have secrets around someone like that. Hands up, he's got a mother like that. <laughs> um, I always said she'd make a great investigative journalist, my mother. <laughs> her sort of section of the show was, was sort of not just one person reading, but herself reading her story and two others, Richard and Val. Both queer Muslims, 
both coming from very different um, perspectives. Uh, Richard's story sort of had a happy ending. His, his, his family um, needed some hand-holding and some steering along, but they've, they've come through everything and they're, they're still very close as a family. And Val, sadly, was, was, was not such a happy outcome, so she, she, she doesn't have any contact with her family anymore. Most people are way more interested in who they're going to have sex with than who you're going to have sex with. <laughs> if I did have any advice about coming out, it would be don't rush it. Really assess the risk to make sure you're going to be okay. Only come out when you're good and ready. And when you do, you will find a whole host of organisations ready to help you. You'll also hopefully find some incredible LGBTQ plus friends. And enjoy it. Because I genuinely believe you'll be happier and more content when you can stop hiding who you are and live life as your true and wonderfully unique self. not that traumatic and fairly comical coming out story and it, it's interesting that I said in that that you know a lot of people that's your best case scenario isn't it that people are just disinterested we kind of want that don't we we just want it to be like past the salt I'm gay yeah whatever what time does he stand as well move along um, but for my next um, interviewee it was the worst case scenario I think that's why as LGBT people we stress so much because we hear these horror stories we hear the worst things that can happen we hear about people losing their friends, we hear about people losing their families, we hear about people losing their homes, um, and we've been hearing a story like that now. You are right to come and tell your story, Val? Thank you. Welcome, this amazing, beautiful place to the show. So, I didn't really know I was gay. I knew I was different. I remember the first time I understood what gay was, was in high school, when kids used to call me gay. I said, what's that? To my friends. And they said it was someone that likes boys. Straight away, I was like, oh, I'm gay then. <laughs> and I think that was literally on the first day of high school. Uh, at, the, at home, the word gay wasn't mentioned at all. It was very much see no evil, hear no evil, looking back at it. Um, it was a pretty strict household. I grew up in my grandparents' home. And uh, my mom, and she was a single mother. Uh, and they were quite strict Muslims. My mum was second generation and born here, but my grandparents were first generation, came over from Pakistan in the 50s or 60s. Uh, so yes, I was praying, going to the mosque, I read the Quran three times, which took three years. I went to Arabic school, I fasted for Ramadan, I watched Islamic TV shows in Sky, which was a super massive thing back then, um, not really now. Uh, I still identify as Muslim. I'm more of a liberal Muslim or a spiritual Muslim. I believe in all the teachings. Uh, I just don't really do what I'm meant to do. <laughs> um, it's my personal relationship with God that uh, I concentrate on anyway, because it's only between me and him. So anyway, uh, eventually my mum found out I was gay. We had moved out of my grandparents' house at this point, and it was when I was like 15. Uh, my maths teacher heard some of the boys in my class calling me gay. I just kept telling them to shut up, uh, but uh, just as everyone was leaving, my teacher asked me what the boys were talking about and asked if they were calling me gay. And I was like, yeah. And he was like, are you? And I was like, yeah. And then he just said, that's fine, you can go. I didn't think anything of it. Um, but then when I got home, I was upstairs advising for some exams. Um, my mum screamed my name from downstairs. Uh, we already had a tumultuous relationship anyway, because my mum was very much unstable due to things that she's been through in her life. So we didn't have a very good relationship on the door with the actress was close. So I came downstairs, sat on down on the couch opposite her, and she was like, so I just got a phone call from one of your teachers who said that you're gay. And uh, so basically my South Asian maths teacher had called up my mum because he's also a South Asian Muslim, and he thought she should know. So from then on, it just went downhill. At the time I was just thinking, how am I gonna survive? Is she gonna kick me out? Is she gonna murder me? I just went into survival mode and was trying to deny it to her. But she was like, I know, I know, you don't need to deny it. And I was like, okay. And I was literally crying and it got really physical, so I locked myself in my room. Um, she took it really badly and really badly. Uh, but it got to the point where she ended up kicking me out. So she called my granddad to pick me up and I ended up living with them for about a year. But she never actually told them why she kicked me out. So you just sort of went cold and it speaks to me for like a year. My grandparents didn't ask any questions, they just took me in. 
I wasn't tempted to come out to them at all because of all the physical abuse on my mom. They really damaged me. I just thought I'd rather be safe. And all this was happening during my GCSEs. So I had to study for my exams and go through all of this with my mom. So it impacted on my GCSEs a lot. But in the end, after a couple of months of me living at my grandparents, my mom rang with me and ended up calling them out of spite and saying, you do realise why I threw him out. He's gay. And so I told them. And that set off the chain reaction with my granddad. My grandma herself was quite a meek person. I was really close to her. She was like my second mum. So she was just crying, but my granddad went into a flurry of rage and violence. He just grabbed me by the throat and tried to strangle me. So at that point, I pushed him off, locked the door in my bedroom, I found a spare bin bag that I had, and grabbed as much of my stuff as I could and ran out of the door. I was literally on the streets in rain, figuring out what to do. Luckily, a couple of weeks prior to that, uh, I reconnected with a primary school friend and they lived around the corner. So I hadn't seen them since primary school, but I thought, I'm just going to go straight there. So I walked 25 minutes in the rain with my two bin bags and explained to them what happened. They were a white family, so they were really loving and accepting. Um, and they knew I was gay. So I stayed there the night, and that was the start of my independent journey when I was 15. It's now been 11 years since I spoke to my family. They don't have my number, they don't know where I live, and I know for sure that I'm never going to speak to them again, but I've made peace of that. But I made my chosen family, and they love me. Like, they've shown me more love than I've had in the whole 15 years of my own family, so I'm really grateful for that. So no, I don't have any regrets. If I could speak to my younger self, I would say, don't be afraid of being South Asian and gay. Don't be afraid of being Muslim and gay. You can be both, and you are made in God's image, and God loves you. Thank you. It's very powerfully moving hearing that from somebody obviously very young and somebody who'd had to sort of forge their own, well, go and create their own logical family, you know, because they had no other choice, basically. Um, and to be raised by the people around her as opposed to the people that were entrusted to raise her. She was all, she's also a drag performer who I'd heard about from other people. I knew, I knew, I knew I'd never seen her, but I knew of her and she's, 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 uh, she's making quite a, quite a mark certainly in Manchester and also further afield. She's performed at UK Black Pride and other, and other places. Um, and Will, the guy on the door, had, was, is a big fan and he, he, he sort of recommended her. And she was fantastic because at the beginning of the show we had her t telling her true story and at the end of the show we had her performing. So you sort of saw both sides, of the, the, the vulnerable person sharing a very, you know, heartfelt, true story of all the obstacles they'd face coming out as a as a gay Muslim. And then you then had the sort of defiant self-creation that that, that 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 she'd made, which is this very, very powerful drag queen. Um and she was very, very powerful on stage. Her act is 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 quite extraordinary. It reminded me a bit of um the the late great Regina Fong where Regina used to use bits of audio from various bits of pop culture, songs, but also dialogue from movies, bits of um, from advertised, television advertising, radio advertising, and just mime to it. But it was all kind of collaged together and edited together. And Val does something similar, but it's specifically about Asian representation. So it's about um, Asian women in soap operas or on television, and she just cuts bit, bits and pieces together. And then she does um, Bollywood dancing, and the music plays over the top. And it's it's hard to explain. You need to see it. It's very difficult to describe it, but it's it's incredibly funny. One of the things that I liked about getting to hear Val's story and Richard's story was the fact that the book also covers people from all types of backgrounds. And as you say, we're talking about two Muslim people, one from a South Asian background and one of uh, African origin. And it was just really interesting hearing these stories. And as you say, one has a happy ending and the, the other one does not. And Val also speaks about a teacher and potentially being betrayed by a teacher at the school. Uh, whereas with Richard, there's more of a sense that teachers were made more of a positive thing. And obviously both of them are now role models themselves and they, and they want to give back. What were teachers like when you were growing up? Did you have any that were inspirational or that kind of showed you a way of being? Or maybe you thought they were gay or did you have other people in your life who, you know, you weren't really sure about, but you thought they might provide uh, another way of living that you weren't aware of as a young person? 
there were no out gay teachers that I was aware of at my school. Um, there was an English teacher called Mr. Archard, who is um, a fantastic man, um, who isn't gay, but who um, is very outspoken about um, gay rights and so on, and a very progressive person. And when I was in sixth, the sixth form, or maybe the fifth form, actually, um, we were studying um, Sons and Lovers by D.H. Lawrence. A girl in the class called Alison um, raised her hand and said that she thought Paul Morell was, quote, a bit of a puff. And Mr. Arch had hit the roof and just said, what a disgraceful thing to say. And I'm so sick of hearing people make these snide comments about gay people. I have gay friends. And by the, by the time he'd finished this little outburst, um, Alison's face was bright red and so was mine. Because it was the first time I'd ever heard anyone say anything about gay people in anything other than a, than a, than a, a negative sense. It was the first time I'd heard anyone ever own up to having gay friends. I mean, what on earth did that mean? I mean, it was really shocking to me at that at 15 or 16. I didn't know anyone who'd say something like that. Um, this was, you know, the, the mid 80s. So very different time to now. And this is South Wales as well. So, you know, different place to now. But at the time that that gave me so much hope that there was um, this teacher who I really admired. I used to go to, um, he, he ran after school um, groups. There was a reading group and a writing group, and I went to both of those regularly. So he was a teacher I admired hugely. And, and to hear him sort of st 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 stand up for gay people publicly in the classroom had a huge impact on me as a, as a young person um, because I'd never heard that before. I'd only ever heard negative um, comments before jokes, um, and the media. There was, you know, there weren't, there weren't gay characters on soap operas back then. There weren't gay characters on television. Um, occasionally, there may be a, a character or a, a personality on television that you thought might be gay, but it was usually the butt of a joke, or it was it was played for laughs. Um, there weren't, you know, sympathetic portrayals of gay people on television. Just didn't it just didn't happen. The Naked Civil Servant, which came out when I was nine, I think, um, Quentin Crisp's memoir, which was made into a um, television drama with John Hurt. I mean, that was such a landmark piece of television because it was so, and it was so rare. You just never ever saw anything like that. You know, for for years afterwards, it was it's, it remained the only the only sim vaguely sympathetic portrayal I'd ever seen. Um, so. Yeah, to hear to hear a, a, a teacher, especially one that that I looked up to, um, speak about gay people in in that way, had a profound impact on me. Um, and then the my other English teacher, who shall remain nameless, who was a woman, when she heard about it, was really scornful that he that that, that he sh saying he shouldn't he shouldn't have raised this subject in the classroom. And this is all before Section Twenty Eight. This is all before um, Margaret Thatcher, um, famously you know, started her attacks on, on discussions around homosexuality in the classroom. Um, it was, it was a, the time bef just before that. So it was part of my sort of political awakening in a way, I think, that, you know, realising the power that um, teachers had as role models to educate you, not just about the subject at hand, but also about how to be a better person. Joining me in the virtual studio is poet and author Joelle Taylor, and we're talking about her new collection of poetry from the Westbourne Press. I've had the pleasure of hearing live extracts from the poetry book twice, once at Polari, which was one of my first outings since lockdown, and once at Above the Stag Theatre, where Joelle got a deserved standing ovation for her performance. We're here tonight to talk a little bit more about the book and to get more into its depths. Joelle, how are you this evening? I'm very, very good, Sophia. I'm in a really good mood. Fantastic. Well, you look great. I wish the audience could see you sort of surrounded by sort of pink glow and your microphone completely <laughs> fab. Um, but we're here to talk about your new collection of poetry, which I've heard you read from a couple of times. And can you tell us just a little bit about the collection to contextualise it for the audience? So it's called Conto and Othered Poems. Um, Conto is a word mean, from cont country meaning um, to tell or recount a personal story, um, and which is essentially what it is. It's part conjecture, part memoir, and it unearths the untold story of the butch counterculture in the UK, particularly within London, in the sort of mid 
80s to mid 90s. If I start from the beginning, the book begins when a series of vitrines appear outside all the old LGBT haunts. So outside the Lesbian and Gay Centre in Crowcross Street, um, outside cottages, squats, everywhere we used to kind of hang around and communicate. And inside a vitrine is like a, a display case. So there are massive ones like in, in museums and there are much smaller ones like uh, snow globes or little glass music boxes. And there are impossible things inside each one. They come from my personal uh, memory, but also from LGBT history. So you have an explosion caught in aspect, which is the Admiral Duncan. Um, you have somebody's first kiss. You have like a terrine of dancers on a dance floor. Um, yeah, so it's about it's about it's about oh, preservation. The word preserve is quite big within the book. Um, but it's also about fragility and about these spaces we've lost. And inside the book, we enter a couple of those vitrines, one of which is, <laughs> frankly, me. Um, it's a 50-year-old woman in a boxing ring, um, and it's, bar it's roped off with barbed wire, and in the opposite corner is a three-piece suit, and she does a series of cantos about that experience. But I do a series of cantos about what it was like growing up as a masculine dyke, or just being being a butch, you know, and um, that sense of, of exile and how it was different then than it is now and that when you came out, what you were really doing, you weren't coming out, you were leaving. There was a real sense of um, there was no going back, you know. Um, so I wanted to pay homage to my own experience. So it would be nice to me for a change. But also my favourite part of the book is the middle called O Maryville. And in that vitrine, in this little snow globe, is this old dive, Dyke Bar, which is an amalgam of all the Dyke Bars I used to hang out in. And if you recall, Sophia, um, we could go out every night to a different kind of space. And we all had our spaces too. So they were almost community centres. So the book's very fixed on four characters who are real based on real people that I loved and knew who um, were a, a huge part of that kind of community during that time. Um, yeah, and it's a way of, of um, commemorating them and holding up, you know, I'm very into what happens when you put something ordinary in a glass frame, you know, and then we really look at what's happened and what, what has been given to us. So that's, that's the sort of idea. And it's a real simple story, you know, for women butch women who are friends and one night the drunk men come because they always come if you recall back in the day and um and it's what happens it's just about how they come together as a whole bar the maryville bar which is made up not just of you know dykes they're the predominant but it's much more about our sense of i don't know unity so various aspects of the community I put her on before the interval, and um, which I always, I always make sure there's an interval after Joelle because she's 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 too difficult to follow. Uh, especially now, you can't really bring on anybody else after her, and also with the intensity of the new poems, people need time to go and decompress, don't they? Exactly, and um, you you could you could feel it in the audience after she'd finished her set. You could you could see that people were needed. I mean, some people went to the bar straight away and some people, some people just stayed in their seats and you could see they were literally still recovering. You know, they were just sitting there trying to absorb everything. Please welcome the mighty Joelle Taylor. Hello, how are you? You all right? Yeah, that's it, that's the act. <laughs> yeah, so um, it's very moving for me to be in Manchester. You probably can't tell, but I'm actually Mancunian. I was born here and I was raised um, for a little tiny bit in Stretford. <laughs> and you were all going to go like, hmm? And then I was dispersed like a flicked raindrop around the country. So I've got 15 minutes to change the world. And I just wanted to um, do a little bit from my new book. It's called Kanto and Other Poems. And I know you're thinking like, Kanto, what means? <laughs> and I'd just like to read you the uh, opening inscription, which is that Kanto means to narrate, tell, or recount a personal story, third person, of person, singular, past historic. That's <laughs> it. Nothing to do with cantos about women at all. Actual word. 
So it's really interesting. Um, thank you so much to the guys, Emma and everybody who got up to talk about their coming out stories. Because it got me, this whole book really is centered around what it was like coming out in the early 80s, late 70s in the northwest of England. It was magnificent. <laughs> Back in those days, we didn't do like coming out stories. We did coming out, like get out. Like literally, you said you were gay and then you just kept walking. You know, and I ended up in London. It took a long time to get there. I've been there around 30 years. But this is a, a kind of a book. It's a memoir, part memoir, part conjecture, also bonnets, about what it was like being part of um, a dyke scene, an underground dyke scene in the late 80s and early 90s in London. It's a particular kind of tribute to butch women. Oh, oh all right, hello. Um, <laughs> And I've only got a short period of time, so I'm going to do the first piece from it. But before I begin, just to set what the book's about. So a series of vitrines start appearing around London and across the whole of the UK. A vitrine is like a museum display case. And they come in different sizes, so some of them are massive, and some of them are very, very small indeed. So inside the vitrines, you have very public moments, like the Admiral Duncan exploding in Compton Street. Remember, it's memoirs, so it's things I've kind of been present at or around, adjacent to. Um, and very personal things like our first kiss or just a memory of a night dancing. Um, and in one of the vitrines is um, a boxing ring. And the boxing ring is roped off in barbed wire. And inside the boxing ring is an older woman. Um, <laughs> wearing a little pair of white boxer shorts and a little white vest. And in the opposite corner of the ring is this very suit, which is a, a tweed Domi Bell suit. <laughs> and this whole piece I'm going to do is called Kanto, which starts with the book, and it's my personal story of growing up. A big fat leather <laughs> in the end. <laughs> Some girls fall from sun-lit sky straight down into flat, pack floral dresses, grab their smiles from a hook behind the door, rescue their faces from riptides of mirrors. Some girls are always falling. Round one, the body as battleground. You fall and miss your body entirely. Land somewhere in enemy territory behind the lines. Your body, a foreign country, you cannot get a visa for. Your skin, a parachute caught in tree branches. You awaken in no man's land. Come fire from over the horizon and women are crucified on hashtags across the dark hills. It has a huge emotional weight. I mean, and I don't, th I don't think that you, well, I know you, I know for a fact, because I, I witnessed the audience, you don't need to have lived through the period that she's referring to. Um, you don't need to have, have been part of that scene to feel connected to what she's doing. Um, a lot of the people that were there in the audience mm. were too young. They weren't even born when that was when that scene that she's describing was, was happening. Um, there's some scenes at Heaven years ago and there's some scenes, you know, on, on the in the London um, scene of the 80s. Um, I mean, I, there must have been people from about 18 to about 70 in the audience. It was a really wide, broad range of age groups in the audience. And there wasn't a single person that wasn't affected by her reading, her performance, it, it, it touched everyone. So the other author that you had on the bill last night was Okichaku Nzelu, whose novel The Private Joys of Nana Maloney is published by Dialogue Books, uh, who will also shortly be publishing his second novel, Here Now Again. And I loved the novel, and one of the things that I loved about it was uh, how funny it was and how good it is at talking about, well, things from a woman's perspective, which, to be honest, male authors don't always get right. Uh, it's comic, 
epidemic. It's great about anxiety and it's great about Christianity. And I believe it was shortlisted for the Polari Prize in 2020. It was indeed for the first book prize. Yeah, it was. It was a. It was a hot favourite with the judges. I've only. Wor- I've only worked with him once before. I think he performed with us on tour. This was the second time, and he was so funny. I mean, the, the passage that he read, I mean, he read two passages, but it was just so, so funny. And the audience was so, it just, it, it was just a really, really enjoyable reading. And, and it was great fun. He, he's, he's a, he's, he has a wonderful um, presentation as well, the way he, the way he talks, the way, you know, the way that he engages with an audience. I think being a teacher probably helps with that, doesn't it? Because you're used to standing up in front of a classroom. <laughs> um and educating people who maybe don't always want to be as engaged as they as they should be, um, but yeah, he, he he's he's very he has he has a very winning personality and a very a very he's a very good reader, and the material's great. So I mean, it's it's the perfect combination for for a live um, spoken word event. You've got someone who 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 looks and sounds great, and they've got great material. You know, in twenty twenty, his debut novel, The Private Joys of Nana Maloney, won a Betty Trask Award and was shortlisted for both the Desmond Elliott Prize and the Flurry First Book Prize. In 2021, he was selected for the Kingston University Big Read, and his second novel, Here Again Now, will be published by Dialogue Books in March next year. Please welcome, OK. Hi, Gay. <laughs> such a long time. It's the perfect venue for it. Thank you all so much for coming out tonight. Um, yeah, my novel is called The Private Joys of Nena Maloney, and I wrote it with so many different things in mind. The main character, Nena, is a half-Nigerian teenager who's never met her Nigerian dad, and she lives with her white mum in Manchester, and she's trying to learn about her heritage and sort of figuring out her relationship with her mum as she does so, as that changes. But this is also a novel about race and class and sexuality and so many and loneliness and mental health and I guess I really just wanted to write a book that reflected the world that I know. None of these, my friends love to ask me which one is you? And none of these characters are me but in a sense all of them are the world that I know. I, I kind of, I, I, I mirrored a world that I know rather than having to build one from scratch. Um, it was a really weird experience for me. Um, I, I went to, I, I grew up in Manchester, I went to University of New South in Cambridge and it was so different. I grew up here where it's so diverse, you know, I have friends, by the time I was like 12, I had friends from like every major world religion and I thought that was normal. I realised that was not normal. Um, and I, just, I mean, yeah, I wrote a book about it. Um, and I'm going to read from pretty much the start of the novel. Um, the character called, there's a character called Morris who later realises Nella's father. Um, he's Nigerian, he's living in Cambridge and he is trying to make friends um, but he's trying to do it through the church and he's um, a Christian and, he, and he's kind of struggling with his faith and he's belong, he belongs to this sort of like um, Bible study group that's trying to evangelise and spread the word of God by writing quotations about uh, from the Bible on postcards and handing them out to people in cafes because he thinks that's a good way to put people in. Um, the problem is that the people in his, book group, in his Bible group are really the kind of people he wants to be friends with and he finds that that, and really what I what I loved writing about this was that even though they're all in theory linked by belief in God and this kind of very fervent Christianity they're all going through stuff it might be their sort of faith in God is kind of crumbling or wavering it might be something to do with their sexuality that they feel does not quite fit with their beliefs Um, So yeah, I'm going to read from towards the start of chapter one. If you like it, as Paul said, um, my second novel here again now is published next year. If you don't like it, my name is Marcus Rashford. (laughs) (laughs) Morris came from a devout family. Prayers at home each morning before school and two church services on Sundays. There was nothing in the Bible Morris hadn't already seen and heard many times. But surely, even English people, even fair weather sit at the back English Anglicans, should have found it easy to pick a few quotations. Surely everyone knew the kind of thing that was called for. God is love. I am the way, the truth and the life. No one comes to the Father except through blah, blah, blah. But when one Sunday morning, 
in, in their meeting after the service, Morris had suggested these words. Joel had spoken up and complained in his plaintive, weedy, plaintive, weedy little voice. These quotations had been done to death. The public was hungry for something fresher. Morris's selections from the book of Jeremiah simply weren't current. We're speaking to the author, Okachako Unzelu, who's going to be talking to me about his debut novel, The Private Juries of Nena Maloney. Welcome. Hi, thank you so much for having me. Uh, you're very welcome. First of all, congratulations on being shortlisted for the Polari Prize and your other accolades and awards that you've received for your wonderful debut novel. Thank you so much. It's such a huge honour to be shortlisted. I mean, for the Polari Prize, it's just this wonderful, incredible honour. I'm so grateful to be listed with such incredible writers alongside me. It's wonderful. It's huge. Can I just say, I've just finished the novel and I just want to say how funny it is. Was it always your desire to write a comedy or are you just sort of a naturally funny person and, and that came out? Because I, I was expecting a, a, a story that deals with serious themes and, and it does, but it reads a little more, say like a bit Nick Hornby, a bit Jonathan Coe. Um, where, where does the, the humour come from and, and yeah, what, why is it so good? <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. Oh, I wish I got asked that question more. Why is your book so good? Yeah, I definitely always wanted to write a funny novel, but I wrote this book over eight years. And so I did lots of different drafts. And the first sort of, after the first sort of one or two drafts, I showed it to a friend and I said, hey, this is my new, I think I must have said something like, this is this book I've been working on. Um, it's meant to be a kind of a funny take on X, Y, Z. And she kind of read it and got back to me and said, well, it's, I mean, it's kind of funny. And then I thought, okay, this isn't, the humour really isn't coming through. So I went back and I redrafted it. So I did always want it to be funny, but it definitely took some work. And thank you so much for like comparing me to like, oh, those huge names. Those are the types of humour that I've always been really trying to channel that really like funny, um, just really quite characteristically British types of humour that really, really inspired this novel. Oh, they, they are characteristically British, but there's also something, you know, while, while they're subtle, they are still very definitely jokes. And I love the fact that you really embrace jokes in, in the book. I think that that's a wonderful thing. Is that there's not enough of it. There's a lot of terrifically serious stuff at the moment, as maybe there should be. It doesn't hurt to have a few laughs here and there. And I, I certainly enjoyed it because there's a lot to take in, especially in the very rich first chapter where we meet a uh, well, meet some of the characters for the first time in a, in a cafe in Cambridge. But before we get onto that, can you just tell the audience a little bit about what the book's about? Yeah. So the book, at its heart, is the story of Nana Maloney, who is a 16-year-old girl living in Manchester. And she's about to turn 17. She is half Nigerian, and she lives with her single mum, Joni, who is white. Um, Nana and Joni have a really close and tender relationship with lots of warmth and humour um, and trust. But... Uh, when Nana starts asking questions about her Nigerian father, who she's never met, and her Nigerian heritage that she has no, that she feels no real connection to and knows nothing about, this puts strain on their relationship. So the novel is really about the two of them growing up and learning about themselves and about each other. And it also features a sort of a cast, a diverse cast of characters who um, make up sort of everyday life in Manchester and are experiencing coming of age in their own sorts of ways, in different ways, at different times of life as well. There are two places that particularly dominate um, where the book is set. And there's a sort of the two like foreign areas that Neda thinks about a lot, but which we don't visit, which are Nigeria and Paris, respectively, because she has a natural gift for French. And her teacher has suggested that she studies at the Sorbonne, which sends her, her mother into a bit of a tailspin after a parent's yeah. evening. But the two places in the UK that most dominate are Cambridge and Manchester. Um, can you tell us a bit about your connections to those places and why it was important to you to depict them uh, so accurately in the book? Yeah, so Manchester is where I live and where I'm from. I was born here, I grew up here, I came straight back here after university. So it's a place in the world that I know the best and I have a real love for it. I love the city and its diversity and its vibrancy and uh, just I love the life here. It's a wonderful place to be. Um, Cambridge is where I went to university. So um, I was there something like 20, 15, 20 years after Joni would have been there. So things were very different for me from how they would have been for her um, in a lot of ways. But um, it's a city that I know a little bit of the history from. And I've, I've spoken to people who were there sort of around Joni's time. Um, and so their experience has partly informed my research um, and the novel. So um, I wanted to write a novel about partly about what I know. And that was why I chose those two places. 
So in Cambridge, when Joni and Nana's father meet for the first time, Nana's father is part of an evangelical group who are in a cafe trying to spread the word of the Lord. And they're deciding what Bible verse to include on, on some of their materials, um, during which we get to know quite a lot about each of them in a very short space of time, including that, you know, some of them have, have feelings for each other, despite all being guys. And then Joni walks into the middle of this um, lonely disappointed, uh, worried, and I think a lot of undergraduates can definitely, you know, they'll recognise themselves, especially in a place as imposing as Cambridge, she's just thinking, this is not going well, and then she meets Nana's father. Um, but every chapter starts with a Bible verse, some better known than others. Was it important to you to have that thread running through it, given that the novel doesn't engage hugely in religion like it's not a novel about religion and yet there are these quotes that sort of sew everything together yeah definitely the novel for me uh, it partly expresses my way of seeing the world so I have a, had a sort of similar experience in some ways to some of the characters in that I grew up in the church I had sort of Morris's experience of kind of church going Christianity with my family when I was younger but as I got to about Nana's age I left the church and, and yet despite that despite my sort of loss of faith um, the sort of the language of the bible the the, the world view that that offers in a lot of ways still characterizes the way I see the world that journey from um, that journey to redemption and that that the um, importance of forgiveness and um, the ability to enact your own redemption, I think, are really important to me and to the story. So I really wanted that to be, um, to run alongside the, the narratives that the, the characters lead and to run alongside their lives and their journeys. So as we record this, Paul, in the UK, we've just had National Coming Out Day. What are your thoughts on coming out? Do you think folks who are making LGBT plus art need to come out or is there some kind of room for flexibility? What, what are your thoughts on being out as an artist? I think personally that coming out is a personal decision. I think people should come out as and when they're ready to. Um, I don't think anyone should be, people shouldn't be forced to come out according to somebody else's time schedule. There are exceptions to that, though, and one of them is if that if the person who isn't out is actively causing harm to other LGBTQ people, e.g. a hypocritical politician or church leader or somebody who's preaching one thing and doing another, then I think there are, there are case, a case to be made there that that person um, should be unmasked and outing them is a, is a kind of self-defence. And the other thing where I, where I do find it a bit complicated is where somebody is promoting or producing work which capitalizes on the experiences or the or, or, or the or the, the loyalty of gay audiences because I think that if you're producing work which is clearly aimed at that audience work which 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 explores those characters those themes and you're not being honest about yourself. You're somehow betraying the work to me. I think that I think there's a betrayal going on there. I I do understand why actors in particular are very hesitant often because it's very difficult to be an out uh, a gay actor because um, casting directors and producers and directors may see you as being. Um, not capable of playing anything other than gay roles and you end up being pigeonholed and, and typecast and you don't get the work. But on the other hand, if you're if you're going to be in the closet, I my advice is to stay clear of the gay work. I'm not going to tell you any names, but I mean, I, I as a journalist, have been in a situation before I've, where I've gone and interviewed somebody who's starring in a well-known gay play. And I know for a fact this person is gay because I've met them socially, but they're not out. So I'm having to interview them about this gay play and about these gay themes. And they're talking about it as if they're not personally invested in it. And I find I have a problem with that. The other thing about coming out, which I think is often missed whenever we have, you know, c coming out day or is that people, it feeds into this narrative that coming out is an event and it isn't. Coming out is an ongoing no. process. You come out all the time. I mean, I've I've come out thousands of times in my life and I probably come out thousands of times more. Um, I can remember, you know, specific occasions, e.g. the first time I told another living person that I was gay, 
and I'm and those 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 would be my coming out stories or part of my coming out stories. Um, I can remember when I first told my parents, which was in in a letter, which was modelled on Michael Tolliver's letter to Mama from Tales of the Mama, City, yeah. <laughs> and I can remember you know coming out to close friends and other family members, etc., and and going through the the fear of rejection and, and all that stuff, but. Those aren't the only coming out experiences. You know, you you come out. I was on a train going to uh, Scotland at the weekend and there was a, some people sitting across the aisle from me and the, the woman was very chatty and asked me about what I did. And I said I was a writer. Then she asked, what, what did I write? And then you mentioned what you write. And then, oh, what's your name? And then suddenly her husband's Googling me. And then suddenly you can tell by his face that he's Googled me and discovered that I'm gay. So... I'm, I'm I'm coming out then. That was a coming out experience, yeah. you know. So it's it's a thing that's that often people don't understand. I mean, I think heterosexuals, not obviously not all of them, but sometimes you hear heterosexual people say, "Well, why do you need to make for su such a big fuss about it?" And you think, "Well, hang on a second, heterosexuals broadcast their sexuality all the time. When you have a picture of your wife and your kid on your desk, you're broadcasting your heterosexuality to the world. People." take public space for granted in a way that same-sex people don't. I mean, I certainly don't take public space for granted. I'm always wary of um, showing affection to my partner in public because you never know who's watching and what they might do. You know, coming out is, is something that we negotiate constantly. And I don't think we ever stop, really. One of the sad things that I hear more and more as I get older is of people older than me, people who are in, many, in many, many instances have been out all their lives and been very politically active and then are going into care homes and there isn't provision for them and they're either having to suffer homophobic abuse, which I know of a couple of people who've been in this situation, or they're having to choose to not disclose who they are for fear of suffering homophobic abuse. So they're basically going back into the closet, which is really, really, really sad. It is. It's not what you want and it's not what they deserve at the end of a difficult life. So I think, I think, I think, I think you know, I think, it's 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 good that we have a focus on coming out. It's good that we that we have um, occasions, whether it's through social media or whatever whatever place it is. But um, th there becomes a focus for people sharing those stories. And I did follow them all on social media the other day. There were some very sad ones and some very happy ones. Um, but I think we have to remember that that's only part of the story. That isn't the whole story.